Hey, we've got a great uh, blessing this morning. We are going to call Sue. She's going to come and share the Word of God with us this morning. Let's give her a hand as she comes up. Good morning. <laughs> and thanks for communion, Pauline, this morning. I think we must have had some sort of osmosis because um, <laughs> my message is about trials today. <laughs> but before I get into my message, um, I just wanted to tell you about something that I watched uh, a couple of weeks ago that I think um, is worth sharing. And it really reinforces what amazing creatures we are or creations we are, I should say. Um, and this show I was watching, it had a, a brain function specialist and she was explaining how the brain has three levels. And she compared these levels to gears. And when the brain is in top gear, it functions really well. Um, we can think consciously and we can remember what we've, we've been told. And when the brain is in that bottom gear, we don't think consciously. We use access to, um, to basic functions and we can't think clearly. And she explained that when we're fearful, that um, the brain automatically downshifts. Um, it's not a learned thing. It, it just happens automatically. Uh, and sometimes we need to be in that lower level of the brain um, when our fear is genuine and we're in real danger. It's that fight or flight level. Um, but a lot of the time, when our brain shifts to that level, we really don't need to be there. We might feel threatened or anxious, but we're not in real danger. For instance, you know, if we watched a scary movie, we might, um, we might feel... We're not really in, in danger, but we might just feel frightened. Uh, another example might be if we're anxious about public speaking. <laughs> Um, and when we, we feel like we're shifting into that lower level of the brain, there's a couple of things that we can do to, to get back to top gear. And one is to find humour in our situation, so to laugh at something. And the other is to be grateful for something. Research has shown that fear and gratitude can't simultaneously exist in the brain. Yeah, I just found that really so amazing and worth sharing. And I knew at this point my brain would probably be working in one of those lower levels. <laughs> I did think about telling a joke, but I'm, I'm not as good as Al at that. So, um, <laughs> and I might go into the flight mode. So I thought I'd start with a prayer of gratitude. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you created the earth with everything that our physical bodies need. And then you created us to enjoy it. Lord, instead of giving you the glory for everything we had, we rejected you and we gave glory to earthly things that you made for us. But you still loved us and you made a way through Jesus for us to come back to you. You didn't have to and we didn't deserve it, but you did it anyway. And we are so thankful for Jesus and we are so thankful for your promise of eternal life through our salvation. Amen. Okay, um, like everyone here, and I know I'm not Robinson Crusoe in this area, I've been facing some trials lately. There seems to be always something going on, doesn't there, um, that has the potential to cause us to worry or stress or, or worse. And I don't know what I'd do without my faith in God. I've been learning a lot about trials from the letter of James, both learning and being reminded how I should live as a Christian and how I should face trials. Because we are called to live differently as Christians, and James reminds us how we should live. The way James speaks is quite direct. His words aren't a recommendation. He's telling us straight how we should live. He doesn't give us a couple of options. He's very clear, but I really like that. I'm not saying that I'm so spiritually mature that this is the way I live all the time, but James definitely gives us direction with no uncertainty. There is some, or well, there has been some controversy about James' letter. Some think James is writing about being saved through our works, but James says that we are not saved, we are not saved by works, but for works. Just like it says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And James' teaching follows these verses by showing us that we are not saved by the things we do, but that when we are saved, we are called to do good works for Christ in his name. And through our good works, the works that God pre-planned for us after our salvation, we bring glory to him. Just for a bit of background, James is Jesus' brother or half-brother, although he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until he appeared to James after his death. After James became a believer, he wrote this letter. It was one of the first written in the New Testament, only around 12 years after Jesus' death. So it was before Paul's letters and before the Gospels. And James went on to become the leading elder of the Church of Jerusalem. James was writing to Jewish believers, those who believed Jesus was their saviour and who had given up their Jewish traditions. His letter is concerned with the way the believers were living and whether, whether they were living as those who followed Jesus should. So this letter is very relevant to us, not the Jewish part, but whether we are living as we should. And my, my message today is about what James says about the way we should face trials. James chapter 1 verse 2 in the New King James Version says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And that's not a very easy thing to hear, especially when you're going through a difficult time. In fact, it's probably not what you want to hear from someone that you've just confessed a struggle to. Just consider it all joy. It'll all be good. And it's probably not something that I would say to somebody, especially if, I didn't know, if they didn't know what James meant by consider it all joy. A trial, as explained in the dictionary, is a test of the performance, qualities, or suitability of someone or something. The verse also says that when you fall into these trials, or when you fall into these tests, the NIV uses the word encounter. When you're unexpectedly faced with something or when you unexpectedly encounter something. And James says that these can be a variety of things. They could include persecution, temptation, sickness, financial or relationship struggles, all those problems that we face from day to day. And sometimes it seems like every day. So when we unexpectedly face these everyday difficulties, they're a test of our performance. And God uses these tests to help us grow, to grow into the person he wants us to be. God allows these trials or tests, whether they're big or small, God has allowed them into our lives. There aren't some things he has control of and some things that he doesn't have control of. And knowing that our trial is from God and that he has complete control and that whatever we're going through is to grow us into the person that we're meant to be, the person he wants us to be. That's what James mean, means when he says, count it all joy. It reminds me of that song, he's making a masterpiece. God is shaping us, perfecting us, creating something that is exceptional. He has allowed these struggles because he loves us. We are in God's hands. Consider it all joy. To consider it all joy is to be confident that God will create something from our trials. They're sent to strengthen us. They are not a consequence of our sin. God doesn't allow these trials because we've done something wrong. Is it our usual reaction to consider trials all joy? Well, James says that it should be. <laughs> it's not something that comes naturally or even easily, but it's something that God will help us with when we ask. One day, and it may not be in this life, 
will understand why they happened, why God allowed each difficult situation into our life, why it had to be this way. But in the meantime, we have to decide how we're going to handle them. We have a choice. Do we obey God and consider them all joy? It is a choice, and James says that it's a proper attitude we should have as Christians. Someone that doesn't know or believe this, they don't really have that choice. They have a choice, but there's no real meaning behind it. All they do is turn off that feeling. But for us, it's so much more than that. We're obeying a God that we know and loves us and has our best interests at heart. We can choose joy because we have that knowledge that God is in control and we're being made into the image of Jesus. James chapter 1 verse 3 says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or perseverance. What we need to be joyful in a trial is knowledge. The knowledge that the trial is a test and that how we react will determine whether we pass that test or not. Our reaction and the way we handle the trial is more relevant than the outcome of that trial. What's important is that we acknowledge God is in control and we are aware God is shaping us through that trial. These trials aren't to harm us, but they're to grow us. James is saying that our attitude and feelings of joy shouldn't waver, even though we're going through a hard time. We may feel sadness or anger or some other feeling, if we're, but if we're spiritually mature, our attitude shouldn't change. And that's not an easy thing to hear. But my character shouldn't change with my circumstances even in tragedy, because my circumstances are allowed by God. And I want to be the most spiritually person I can be, and that does worry me a little bit, because I know it's going to mean a lot of trials from God. If you want the kind of spiritual maturity that, that James is talking about, you're going to have to face a lot of trials. James chapter 1, verse 4 says, But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Lacking in nothing means lacking, uh, means lacking nothing in spiritual maturity. We should be joyful under trials because we know that we will grow and become complete in spiritual maturity. And verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, and that's wisdom in spiritual maturity, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is a wisdom to be joyful under trials, the knowledge that gives us the wisdom to be joyful under trials. James is saying that when we are facing trials, we can come to, to God and ask him how to face it with joy, and he will always give us the answer. If we ask him... He will always give us the wisdom that we need because he wants us to pass these trials and to grow. I heard someone explain that it's like an open book test. We have the test or the trial that we're facing, but we can ask God for the answer and they'll always be given to us. James says we need to ask God, not a friend or a spiritual advisor, but God. He will give us the knowledge, the wisdom to face it with joy. Verses 6, 7 and 8 say, But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When we pray and ask God for wisdom to face trials with joy, we have to ask in faith. We can't waver or doubt that it is God and only God that can, change, that can give us the answers that we need. We can't look to a book, unless it's his word, or ask a really wise friend what we should do. It's only God that can help us face that trial with joy 
He is the only one who can give us direction. And God may lead us somewhere or to someone else, but it's God that we go to first. If we don't get an answer straight away, we can't go somewhere else in these circumstances. And part of our trial is the way that we solely rely on God and not be impatient for an answer. An example of wavering might be going to God in the first instance and not liking what he has to say and then going to a friend to ask their advice. I've heard wavering explained a little bit like this story. There was a young girl who shoplifted. It was the first time she'd done anything like this before and she wasn't caught, but her mother finds out. You know, we always find out. <laughs> and it's not a true story. It's not about me. I did some things I hope my mother doesn't know about. But um, <laughs> The mother knows what James says about asking God for an answer to face her trial with joy. So that's what she does. And God puts on her heart that she should make the daughter take the goods back and face the consequences. The mum doesn't really want to do that. She doesn't want to get a daughter into that much trouble. So she mentions it to a friend, and that friend says that she owns that, she knows the owner of the shop. She's quite well off. She probably wouldn't even miss it. So the mother goes to God again and asks the same question with the friend's response in the back of her mind. God doesn't answer this time. So the mother doesn't make the daughter take the goods back. And the next time she shoplifts, she gets caught and the police get involved. The mother didn't hear from God the second time because he had already given his answer. The mother was like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. She wavered, she doubted God's answer. James says, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So when we ask for the wisdom to face our trials, we must ask God only in faith and be patient and wait for his answer and expect his answer. As we grow in our spiritual maturity, we'll learn to rely on God's direction. We'll be equipped for trials and we'll be able to cope with whatever comes along. Instead of wavering, will be stable and accepting of trials, whatever they bring. We may not understand them, but we will accept them, and we will have the wisdom to get through them. We will obtain wisdom that only God can provide. I want to tell you about a documentary that I saw on TV. It's a true story about a Christian family from a rural farming district in the northern tablelands of New South Wales. And it's about facing, I feel, the ultimate trial. They were a family of five, mum, dad and three children. And the parents had brought the family up knowing and loving God. Their faith was everything to them, is everything to them. On this particular day, mum had gone into town And the dad and the younger son went to do some jobs on the farm. The little boy loved the farm and loved being with his dad. And when the mum arrived home, she heard her husband's traumatised voice calling to tell her that their boy had been in a farming accident. I knew I'd do this. (laughs) And had passed away. The mum could see her little boy and her broken husband from a distance. And she said that all she could do initially was scream. But after the screaming, she said that she knew that she had to make a choice. She said that she knew she could choose love or she could choose hate. She could project that hate and blame and anger toward her husband. Or she could choose love and comfort her broken husband and they could be together in their grief. She said that God gave her clarity in that moment. And she could see that if she chose hate, she would lose everything that she loved. She chose love and she stood with her husband and she told him that it wasn't his fault. It was just a terrible accident. That day wouldn't have been the end of their trial. But for the mum to have such clarity in that moment, 
shows such spiritual maturity. She said that afterwards she did question why. How could God take her little boy? She had already lost another son who had been born too soon. But she realised it wasn't about why. They both, the husband and wife, found joy and comfort in knowing that God is still on his throne. He is king and he is Lord and he has everything in hand. And they know that for sure that one day they will see that little boy again. One of the dad's favourite verses is John 16:33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. No one avoids trials. Jesus promised we would go through them, whether we are a believer or not. But the trials we go through are worldly. No matter how devastating, Jesus said we can face them with peace because he has overcome the world. Jesus said these words before he had faced his trial of suffering and crucifixion. But he was able to face it because he knew the outcome. And we know the outcome of our trials too. We know that when we go through them with the peace and joy that he said we could have, we're turning into the likeness of him. We can face them with purpose if we trust what he says and walk with him in faith. We can rest in his victory. When we leave this world, the only thing we will take to the next is our spiritual maturity. Don't waste our trials. Face each and every one head on. Ask God for the wisdom we need to grow through each one and to mature to be the person the best person you can be, that masterpiece that God is creating. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are our only Lord, the only one we can find true wisdom in. We know that we need trials for growth and that through those trials you are transforming us into the image of Jesus. Please remind us that each time we walk through a difficult period, that you are there to help us through. We only need to ask in faith and you will give us the wisdom we need to face it with joy. I pray for everyone here and everyone listening today. Lord, please help us walk with you in faith and faithfulness. Thank you for your promise of Jesus coming again. We look forward to eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. Hey, how about we get the worship guys back up? Let, 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 let's finish with that song, uh, Deliverer, again. We'll do that song again, eh? Thank you so much, Sue. There seemed to be a bit of a theme been sort of going on from, from this morning when we got here about trials and testings and difficulties and, and, and stuff like that. You made a statement that I'd never thought of before. Uh, you said that it, it's, it's the way, it's more important how you handle the trial than the outcome of the trial. Never thought of that. All those years I've read that verse, I never thought of that. I'm thinking about that now going, gee, that's actually really, really powerful. That's really powerful. Now, I know many people here are going through uh, different difficult situations and circumstances. We've talked about that. So how about we stand this morning and we just finish by singing that song again, You're My Deliverer. Can I encourage you before you leave, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's spoken something into your heart today, would you grab somebody? Don't just get up, run off, have coffee, have your hamburger, whatever it is for lunch. Why don't you go and grab somebody and say, hey, I want to I want to, I want to tell you, this is what I believe God spoke to me today. I just want to share it with you. Uh, and maybe you could pray for me. Would you pray for me right now in this situation? Maybe there's somebody sitting here today that Sue said really struck a chord with you. Or can I encourage you when, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, he, He's not a gossip. He doesn't just drop things for the sake of them. He's, he's wanting some kind of action, some kind of response from us. That's what faith is. Faith is a response to the goodness of God. It's a response to the Word of God. So maybe you felt like something really hit you there and and God's been speaking to you about some stuff. Why don't you come and grab Sue and and sit down, ask Sue to pray for you. Maybe share, uh, you're not running off, are you, Sue? No, maybe grab Sue and and share what, what you feel like the Holy Spirit's been saying to you today and what He's been speaking into your world. If you're comfortable, let's stand to our feet. Let's, 
lift up the name of Jesus here this morning.